So we are going to go ahead and get started, and I will pass it off to Matthew Shepard, who I believe is going to start. Yeah, no, that's great. Thank you so much, um, Rachel, for that introduction. And good morning, good afternoon, hello to everybody who's out there listening in. Um, I'm, I'm pretty thrilled to be able to um, give this presentation today, and I'm even more thrilled that Jennifer's here to, to help with it, because um, we, we both garden. It's like a lot of things that we, we do in, for work. Um, we also have this life outside of work that intersects. And so, I mean, I, a lot of what we're going to be talking about today is how you can um, provide for the entire life cycle of the, the, the insects um, in, in your yard. And so a lot of the illustrations and examples and things that certainly I'll be talking about are things that I've done in my own yard. Um, as, as a gardener, I, I started gardening on my mother's side, although I admit I didn't enjoy it altogether because it was mostly going around clearing up the, the weed piles that she pulled up. But I got a, li a little bit of pocket money, so it was enough of an incentive. Um, and then since then, I, I just began to love spending time in gardens and, and creating gardens. Um, so Jennifer, did you want to introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Jennifer Hopwood. I'm in Omaha, Nebraska. I also love to garden, although I certainly made plenty of mistakes over the years in various places around the country. <laughs> um, but it's always brought a lot of joy to my life and I've learned a lot while doing it and just really love so, so much about it. Um, but probably most of all, I love the changes that you can that you can watch happen while you're gardening. It's just a really um, interactive experience. So thanks for being with us today. I'm really happy to be here. Okay, well, I will keep keep clicking on. Let's hope the technology works for me. Excellent. So I, I'm sure that many, if not most, of the people um, listening in today know who the Xerces Society is and, and what we do, but just a very quick overview. Um, we are a nonprofit organization. We focus on protection and conservation of invertebrates and their habitat. Um, protecting the life that sustains us is, is how we summarize that because the, the invertebrates are the little things that most people overlook. Um, but they're so fundamentally important to the health of our environment um, and uh, yeah, as well as our, our food supply and our waste disposal and all sorts of different things. Um, we work by um, hands-on conservation, so we partner with um, farmers, land managers, organizations, individuals to create habitat on the ground because in the end if, if there is no habitat we'll, we'll have nothing. Um, we also do advocacy because although we prefer to be positive and, and have, a, have a good relationship with people, um, there are times when you have to stand up and say actually no that's not a good thing to do, you know, you shouldn't be using those pesticides, you, you know, you should be protecting this bumblebee, whatever it might be. Um, we also are involved with research. We are a science-based organization, um, which means that we always like to make sure that we know what the evidence is to, to help us understand the, the, the situation and also come up with um, successful solutions. Um, and sometimes we are working with um, university scientists or agency scientists um, in this country and, and elsewhere to gather that information. Sometimes we're doing it ourselves. I mean, for example, we did a lot of work to figure out the most effective way of being able to prepare a, a site for a habitat planting and, and maintain that using organic methods. Um, and that's now become foundational to um, the work that people are doing all over the place. And then we also have education outreach, um, anything from uh, webinars and uh, workshops. We used to do in-person workshops and we'd, we, we dream of getting back to doing that, but at the moment we're doing everything remotely. Um, but also our social media, our publications, and on and on and on, because in the end, although we're um, a much bigger organization than we used to be, we're still only 50 people and we can't change the world on our own. So we need to engage as many people and get many, many more people involved. So the, the topic of today's um, session is moving beyond plants. 
Um, uh, but also, I mean, I, this is one of the things that's like moving beyond turf too. Th this is a photograph that I happened to walk past these front yards in um, Silicon Valley, California, uh, two or three weeks ago. And I was like, oh no, I mean like, where's anything for any, any kind of wildlife there? It's artificial turf. Um, and so, you know, there are these areas where people are moving towards this, pursuing this ideal dream of um, unrestricted um, or, or you know, unblemished yard using artificial materials. Um, what we really want is we want people to go to completely the other way. Um, there's been a huge movement towards wildlife gardening and a major interest in pollinators um, in the last 10, 15, 20 years. Um, and a lot of that um, really focuses on flowers and plants. Um, and in what we're talking about here, we're trying to move people beyond flowers. Obviously, plants are a fundamental component of, um, of habitat, uh, and, and so we can't do without it. But we need more if we really want to support all the insects. Um, Another thing you can do, and you see here, there's a habitat sign tucked in amongst the plants. You know, you when, when you're creating the, these wonderful wildlife gardens, you can put up signs to explain to people um, why your yard looks like it does. And it could either be a purchased one, or you can make your own. There's, I've seen lots of wonderful um, uh, habitat signs and you know hand painted signs, things that kids have done, signs that other people put up. It doesn't doesn't matter how you do it, but it's a really nice thing to do. Um, as I've already touched on, um, the essence of of um, what we want to talk about here is ways in which we can support the entire life cycle. Um, for your yard to be um, wonderful, for insects, you need to support. Um, and provide food for adults and, and the larvae and the youngsters. We need egg laying places. We need somewhere for the um, insects to pupate. And they also need summer, I mean, summer food and, and winter shelter. And sometimes that's untidy corners and tumble down I and mean, kind of chaos, um, a long way away from that image of the pristine immaculate garden. Uh, sometimes it means having bare ground, which these days is more challenging since a lot of people are um, putting mulches in and other stuff. We need nesting structures and shelter where they can lay their eggs, they can um, pupate, they can survive the winter. I mean, there's already a lot of information out there about the, the idea of um, associated with pollinator gardens of having bee nests. And so this is the first thing that I wanted to touch on this morning is just to go through fairly rapidly how you, how you can create bee nests. Um, the nesting requirements of most of, 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 most of our native bees um, are either a, an old snag, a hollow stem, something where they can get in that already has an existing tunnel, um, or bare ground. Um, of the 3,600 30, species of bees native to the United States and Canada, around about 70% of them nest in the grounds. Um, and almost all of these bees are solitary, so a single female is making her own nest. Um, and so we need to retain any of these, these existing natural features that will support that. You know, snags, shrubs with hollow stems, bare ground. Um, where you do have bare ground, then it doesn't have to be, you know, completely vegetation free because anywhere where the bees can get in, they'll find this, this space um, to, to make their nest. And you'll see in that, that photograph here, these little mounds, um, these are the, the, the soil that's been dug out of the ground by the nesting bee. And there's a little close up of a bee peeping out of the tunnel. Um, to ensure that they have access to the ground, avoiding plastic mulches, avoiding landscape fabric, um, wood chip mulch, um, treated wood bark, all these things which can be great for suppressing weeds or maintaining moisture can also act as a, a barrier to bees getting to the, the um, bare ground. Um, sometimes um, a light rock mulch or pebbles can actually um, make the site better for bees. But given that we're talking of 
70 percent of 3600 species so around about 2500 species there is no single um, conditions that will suit everything so try and have some variety and try and have some um, irregularity but make sure you have bare ground and bear, this doesn't have to be a large area of bare ground that, that photograph you'll see at the bottom of it there's the edge of a concrete drive and then a chunk of rock and that's probably only about six or eight inches of, of width between those those two hard um, surfaces but there's bare ground in between and you'll see just under the edge of the rock there are these these little mounds of soil and the little holes right under the edge of the rock and that's where the bee is nesting um, so you don't need to create vast areas of bare ground you just need to have some bare ground and the bees will be able to exploit it many landscapes particularly smaller gardens you're not, not going to have space for a dead tree with lots of um, beetle tunnels in it and but there are ways in which you can create your own artificial snags um, these are just wooden blocks with holes drilled in them um, or a bundle of hollow stems such as um, bamboo or, or common reed um, you see there i've thrown in some information about the hole diameter um, anything between 3 16 inch diameter and 3 8 inch diameter will be occupied by um, any of our, our native bees and between 4 and 6 inches deep. Deeper if you can and particularly with the larger diameter holes, the deeper it is the, the better it will be for um, uh, bees to occupy and nest in it. And you, you can buy nesting blocks in many garden stores these days. But almost all of those nesting blocks are designed for one particular species of bee, the orchard mason bee, also known as the blue orchard bee. And those holes are typically 5 16 inch diameter. And some bees will also occupy that diameter hole, but there are uh, you know, hundreds of different species of bees, from tiny bees that are you know, only a quarter of an inch long. Um, up to bees that can be three quarters of an inch long or, or larger. And so you need that range of hole sizes in order to, to cater for the, the range and the diversity of um, bees. One of the great things about these, uh, we, there's real solid evidence that, that nesting blocks can work. Um, and it's very satisfying for, for gardeners to see that, that we know what they put up, they get occupied because once the bees have, have made created a nest down there, they seal off that tunnel. Um, you'll see um, soil, you'll see mud sealing it off, you'll see leaf pieces, you'll see resin, all sorts of materials. And, and you, it's, it's great to see. Um, and you can also spend time watching the bees coming and going. So it's like having your own um, wildlife documentary in, in a backyard. But these, these bee nests do have some problems and you do need to stay on top of things like cleaning them out because anytime you have a cluster of um, bee nests, there will be parasites that so will get diseases and fungi growing inside the tunnels. So if you're um, use, using um, straws or there's one style of boards called a binder board, um, you need to make sure that you clean those out. Um, and that can be an annual and should be an annual task. And for some people, it becomes an annual chore. And I, I've met quite a few people who start this process all keen and enthusiastic. And then after a year or two, and they're like, eh, it's, it's more effort than, than they really wanted. Um, so one way to do that is um, just to replace your nests every two or three years. Um, because after a couple of years, that tunnel nest is not going to be, be useful to, as, a, as a nest for bees. And so get a new block, put it up, throw the old one away. Um, and use smaller nest blocks um, with smaller numbers of holes and scatter them around your landscape because there are ways in which you can reduce the, um, the, 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 the buildup of parasites. Another great thing about these nest sites is that they will help more than bees. And in particular, they will help wasps. And I've said that there are thousands of species of bees and there are also hundreds if not thousands of species of wasps that might occupy these. And these are not yellow jackets, these are not hornets, these are solitary wasps which will quite happily fly past your ear and ignore you. And you'll see that the, these nests being occupied, the top photograph has bits of straw grass hanging out of one of those holes. And that's the type of wasp called a grass carrier wasp. 
Um, and the bottom one is um, um, a, a ground nesting wasp, a golden digger wasp, that takes um, tree crickets down and, and in, into its nest. And so by creating this, the right condition for the bees, you'll also be supporting many, many other species of insects. And then I just want to wrap up this segment talking briefly about bumblebee nests. Bumblebees are a social bee. Um, they need a small cavity. In natural conditions, it would be um, and probably a mouse nest with um, abandoned mouse nest with dry leaves and fur in it. Um, but you can create a wooden box. There's nothing too particular. Eight inch cube, maybe a little larger, three quarter inch pipe as an entrance tunnel. Um, a bit of um, soft nesting in there to, to get it started. Um, and these can be great projects, you know, and, and if you have a workshop or your grandpa has a workshop and likes to build stuff, that's wonderful, go for it. But these nests, probably only one in every four or five are occupied. Um, so that you're probably better off making sure that you have some untidy areas where, you know, under fallen ferns or grasses where the bumblebees will find a natural nest area. And at this point, I'm gonna hand over to Jennifer. So we'll have a moment of screen swapping. Okay. Hi, everyone. Hopefully it's getting into presenter mode. There we go. All right, so um, as Matthew gave you a really nice overview of um, some artificial nesting structures for bees, and we're gonna move into discussing some natural habitat features that you can incorporate in your space, or if you already have them, you can keep them in that space. And it's gonna be a few ranges of options. Some of them um, may not be appropriate for your space or for your for your, um, for your region, but you can scale it up or down depending on uh, the space that you have. And um, one of the reasons we're really highlighting these natural features is that they have multiple conservation benefits that, to beyond biodiversity, also to the soil, to water, and also to the health of pollinators and beneficial insects, they mimic the density that you would find in a natural setting. So um, the density of nesting opportunities or overwintering sites isn't so clustered that it um, increases disease and parasites. It, the, the mimicking the natural setting will reduce that. So it's much more beneficial to um, the insects that we're looking to support. I'm gonna start by talking about um, retaining the leaf layer, the leaf litter in your yard or your space. Leaving the leaves is a really um, wonderful and really critical step to, to helping bees and butterflies, moths, beetles, flies, and so much more survive in your landscape. Um, lady beetles and lace wings overwinter as adults in leaf layer. Um, butterflies and moths might overwinter as caterpillars, as pupa or adults within the leaf layer. And even some queen bumblebees will spend the winter sheltering within that leaf layer. So it's really critically important. So rather than shredding it or mulching it into your lawn or bagging it for removal, um, instead you can, you can exert less energy and still save way more critters. So you can spread it, uh, pile it up on your vegetable garden or on top of your flower bed you can pile it under trees or under shrubs and it'll eventually break down and provide a really nice leaf mulch um, after it's served as overwintering habitat for all these different animals. Another feature that supports all sorts of um, bees and solitary wasps is saving the stems. So this means retaining the stems of herbaceous plants like coneflowers, uh, sunflowers, hyssop, um, joe pieweed, and more pithy or hollow stemmed herbaceous plants, as well as shrubs like roses or sumacs or raspberries or blackberries in your garden. Those are all really nice sources of um, nesting tunnels for um, 
solitary bees and solitary wasps. Here you can see the tail end of a small carpenter bee, and she's excavating the pithy stem of a, an old raspberry cane kicking out sawdust there. And saving the stems just means that this fall, instead of doing a traditional fall cleanup, you leave the stalks in place. So your, your old flower seed heads are going to be out all winter long. And this is really beneficial from a bird's perspective. They'll come and eat those seeds in the fall and winter. That's an important food source for them. And then in the spring, you can prune those nests, those stems back. And um, as Matthew mentioned, the deeper the tunnel, the better. So vertically, that means you want to leave about eight inches minimum, and you could go as high as two feet, so 24 inches, just depending on your comfort level and your space and the plant that you're working with. And then that's all you have to do. Once you make that cut in the spring, you can really just sit back and watch activity. You don't need to maintain it. You don't need to clean it. The bees and wasps will use it all throughout the growing season, and then those stems are going to decompose on their own. Um, so that really lowers the disease rate and um, the accumulation of parasites uh, and pathogens. So uh, it's a renewing resource over time. And before your new growth in the summer comes up and those stems become hidden, it really is a wonderful opportunity to watch the bees come in and nest. It's really fascinating to watch their behaviors. So in addition to saving the stems and leaving the leaves, you can plant a log in your yard. This means retaining stumps if you've got them, or if you have a tree that's come down, keeping some logs around. Um, Matthew highlighted the importance of snags, and stumps can also be important to bees. They take advantage of the old beetle borer holes and will nest in those tunnels. But there are also other insects that will um, utilize the space underneath the decomposing log, lots of beetles and flies that use that as overwintering space, and some insects that live within the log. And one key group that I wanted to highlight are uh, best beetles in this picture here. They're also known as patent leather beetles because they're so fancy. Um, these are beetles that live within a log as a family. So in a group, which is a little bit unusual for insects, most insects don't provide parental care, but these beetles actually pre-chew the wood to feed their young and provide quite a lot of care and live in this family setting of one family per log. Um, these beetles will communicate with each other and they have up to 14 different calls. So who would not want these beetles in your yard? They're so cool. And I'm gonna turn it back to Matthew. Thank you so much. Um, oh. Sorry, I was. There we go. Yeah, no, thank you, Jennifer. I was, I was listening to Jennifer. I was thinking, wow, she's the gardener, and it seems like I'm the engineer. I'm the builder with with all these slides, because um, we're back to another another structure. Um, rock piles are another way in which you can introduce the kind of nooks and crannies and the, the shelter, the hidden places where a lot of insects and um, well, not just insects, other invertebrates, whether that's um, centipedes or snails, um, will, will be able to hide away. But with rock piles in particular, um, it can be part of your hard, hard landscape in, in your yard. I mean, that top photograph shows a wall. That's actually in the um, Arboretum in uh, Wisconsin. And they have, a, they believe they have the rusty patch bumblebee nest in, in, in the cavities within that wall, which is, is a pretty remarkable thing. Um, but they, they, can, they don't have to be a big mound. It can be small. And hopefully as we've we're going through this you're beginning to understand that there's no limit to the scale of which you can do you can adapt all these different techniques and ideas to whatever space you have available um, so there's a very a very fine rock wall there um, and a, a small mound that a little heap of old flagstones tucked into the corner of a garden at the bottom and again you know if you've got sticks and branches that's another great way of creating the um 
the, the kind of nooks and crannies and the shelter that a lot of insects and other invertebrates will, would love to have. Um, how big your, your stick pile is depends entirely upon how much space you've got and the materials you, you have available. Um, that top photograph is a, is a huge mound that, that, that I stumbled across. Um, and that one's big enough to have ground squirrels nesting in it um, because these kind of structures will, will provide shelter for so much more than, than um, the insects and invertebrates. Birds will nest in there, mammals will nest in there, um, but also it can be small. You know, there's just a f if you've just got a few um, offcuts of a branch or a, or a few twigs, pile it up. It all, it all helps provide shelter. You might have uh, beetles tucked away in there. You may find overwintering butterflies will occupy it. All sorts of things will make use of that space. You can also um, build things that some people might consider to be more architectural, um, things that will become a feature of your garden. This is one example of something that has, has grown in um, popularity um, over the last 10 to 15 years, the idea of getting old pallets and building, a, you know, building an insect condo, an insect hotel, an insect apartment complex. Um, in this particular example, they've got four pallets, they're spaced with bricks, and then you just stuff all sorts of things into the gaps in between. Um, terracotta flower pots, whether they're whole or, or broken, um, handfuls of straw and stems, twigs, pine cones, old bricks. Some of the engineering bricks have holes in them. Um, and so it's just a way to try and create a structure that provides all the little, little gaps that um, insects, invertebrates, other little creatures can, can get inside and um, shelter in. Um, one thing you do have to be aware of is, uh, like with the um, bee blocks and, and those other artificial structures, you do have to clean it out from time to time. And so again, you're probably looking at a three or four year cycle um, where you can go through it and clean it out. And in this particular example, the best way of doing that is, is probably to clean out one layer each year. Um, because if you were to clean out one side, you realize there's a, you know, you've got a different exposure because some, some insects will prefer the, the cooler north facing side, some will prefer the warmer south facing side. So if you clean out one layer per year, then you're retaining that, that diversity and that variety of exposure. But you can also build these in any way you like with whatever materials you have. This example um, was, was made out of boards from an old um, cedar fence, um, just screwed together with gaps in between. Some gaps are horizontal, some gaps are vertical, um, picked up twigs that fell from trees, fir cones, scraps of rock from past projects, stems from fall trimming. Um, just to push it, push it in and fill those gaps um, to create a, 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 as many small crevices and nooks and crannies as you can. And I, I happen to have an old, old light fitting. Which I always notice when, I, when the light fitting was working, the spiders would, would love it. So I thought, well, I may as well add that to the end. So there was somewhere where they could put their webs again. Although there's no bulb in that. That's just an empty fitting. Um, and you see as well that that's actually bare grass um, growing in front. But another way to create um, a, a more natural level of shelter is to make sure there's bunch grasses and other vegetation growing in front. Another structure, this is a, a, um, an unwanted ornamental wine carrier. Um, there's a little handle on top so you can pick it up and move this around to wherever you want. I, it's stuffed with hollow stems, um, straw, um, a bit of two by four block that that has got holes drilled down the length of it. Um, and because it was a wine carrier, I made sure there were a couple of um, empty bottles in there, um, just because I thought it was funny. Um, but this is small enough, you can pick it up and move it around. So if you wanted to put it in a different part of your garden, um, or you wanted something that um, some people might, might feel was more appropriate in a, in a more obvious spot, um, then basically with all so many of these things, just use your imagination and use whatever materials you have available. Um, and then the last thing is, again, moving us a long, long way away from the idea of the manicured, blemish-free yard. Um, the more untidiness you have, the more you allow plants to get overgrown and collapse and tumble down. Um, 
the more natural areas, natural shelter you'll be providing for the insects. So you don't have to only build things as, as Jennifer was explaining, you can be growing the plants, you can be um, thinking about your fall clear up and tidy up. And this upper photo, photo here, yeah, I had some tall plants that I, I trimmed them off of the stems are two to three feet high, but then what did I do with the rest? I didn't want to throw that in the, um, into the garden debris can. So I found the spot at the back of a planting area where I could just lay them on the ground. Um, just one more way to create a little more chaos. And I think it's uh, over to you now, isn't it, Jennifer? For your pond project, which is the most exciting thing. <laughs> okay. It's just taking a minute to reach. There we go. Okay, so we've been really focusing on terrestrial habitat features, and I wanted to just take a few minutes to tell you about um, an aquatic project we, we um, took on this spring um, to support aquatic insects. Um, my son has been really captivated by a book called On Meadowview Street, and this is a book about a young girl who moves to a house on a street called Meadowview Street. And she's really disappointed to learn that there are actually no meadows on that street. So she sets out to change that and she grows a meadow and then she plants some trees and then she creates a pond in her yard. And her neighbors are inspired to do similar. And my son read that book and was inspired to start digging a pond. So he, in May, once the snow came off the ground, started digging a hole in our, our backyard. And we thought, yeah, we, we, should, we should do that. So um, following his lead, we decided to build a small pond. Um, we don't have a large backyard. It's kind of a weird size. And we have a property line that runs along the edge. That's our neighbor's property right here. So we didn't have a lot of options for where to put this pond. Um, and we had to keep it pretty small also. But we chose this site. There isn't much that grows there. Um, a, a lot of weeds actually, Creeping Charlie in particular. Um, but we chose it because it has a lot of good sunlight and it's not directly underneath a tree. Although there are some, there is some tree debris that does fall in the pond now. So we undertook this in about mid-May. <coughs> And we dug about a foot and a half, two feet down. And that's the deepest portion of the pond. And then there's also a more shallow ledge around that. It's about a foot deep or so. And we did put down a soft lining to protect the pond lining from punctures from old roots and stones that were still in the soil. And then we filled it with rocks and um, gravel and sand and added some water and a log, of course, multiple logs in our yard to play with. Um, we also added some sedges that grow really well in shady and part sun areas and can do well in moist soil. And then we also planted some aquatic plants. Um, what you see uh, right here with my arrow, this is what the pond looked like in May, shortly after we built it. And then about six weeks later, in June, the plants really established pretty quickly and well. Um, right off the bat, we had a couple little um, critters move in, especially water fleas, um, Daphnia. They ate the algae and they zip around. And we also had a whole bunch of mosquito larvae who were looking for a place to reproduce. Um, we added a little solar bubbler that's usually used for uh, but bird baths in particular, just to add a little bit of movement in the water. And it's not, it doesn't move it much, just sort of little burbles underneath the surface, but enough to really cut back on the mosquito larva issue. So that didn't become an issue. And also what probably helped with the mosquito larva issue is that we were really lucky enough to have dragonflies and damselflies find our pond and relatively quickly. And um, we had a really exciting moment in late July um, where my son found a damselfly larva in the water while poking around in the pond. And we've also seen, um, this is an adult, adult blue dasher dragonfly here and a 12 spotted skimmer here. 
Um, and it's really been really fun to dip our hands in, see what comes out and what we can look at in the water and um, watching this pond just become a home for other animals has really been a, um, an enriching experience. So I'm telling this story because this, this pond is quite small. It's only two to four feet, two by four feet. Um, and I'm hoping that it can serve as an inspiration just beyond our yard as well. These small spaces can make a big difference to small animals too. All right, we want to leave you with some resources today. Uh, our website, Xerxes.org, has publications that you can download. Uh, one in particular is geared towards nesting and overwintering habitats. So all these natural features that we've been talking about, uh, you can learn more about those in this publication. The habitat planning for beneficial insects and the farming with native beneficial insects goes into some other detail about insect hotels and brush piles and rock walls uh, as well. And then we also, in collaboration with the Migratory Dragonfly Project, have um, partnerships, excuse me, have a publication on backyard ponds that take you step by step on how to uh, build ponds to attract uh, dragonflies and damselflies. This presentation will be available shortly on YouTube, and you can also find many other really great presentations on our YouTube channel. Xerxes Society's got its own YouTube channel. And we are also um, available and active on social media. And I wanted to, we really are so grateful for our donors. We're a member-based organization and their membership and donations go directly to our conservation work. And if you'd like to find more about how to become a member or donate to our work, you can visit our website at Xerxes.org. And we thank you very much and we're happy to answer questions now. Hopefully we have lots of time to take on your questions. Thank you, Jennifer. Your pond is so beautiful. I'm so impressed with that. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> a lot of comments from people just saying how great it is. And I did, my first question I'm going to ask you is actually, it just made me laugh, but someone said that their husband thinks it'll be a lot of work. And so they're worried about doing it. Was it a lot of work to put in there? Is it a lot of maintenance? Um, it's not too much maintenance. I was really, uh, at first I was totally gung-ho about the pond and then about a day and a half into construction, I got a little overwhelmed, um, but really it wasn't, once it gets going, it, it kind of maintains itself. The one thing I will say is that because it's got a semi-close proximity to a tree, there is a lot of debris that does, that can go into the pond. So um, we do spend some time pulling that out, but it's, you know, once a week, just a couple minutes or more for outside. So it's really no, no problem. And it, it, once it gets going, it really isn't um, a big deal, even though I will say that I had those qualms too. <laughs> awesome. Thank you, Jennifer. So we'll start at the top. We have a lot of good questions. We have quite a few questions about timing of cleaning things out. So before <laughs> I get to those. Um, Jennifer, you would flag this question. Should bare ground be in the sun or is it okay to be in the shade? Um, uh, if it's for bees, um, it's better to be in the sun just because it's, it's warmer, um, but it, it, it's okay to be in the shade. Um, I, one of the things that we um, are still a little lacking, and it's not, when I say we, it's not just this, but it's like science in general. Um, there are so many different species of ground nesting bees that we don't know the specific details of all of them. Um, we know that generally um, bees prefer nesting in soil that is sandier, but there are some bees that will only nest in really solid soil um, and actually will carry water in to soften the soil to make it possible for them to, to dig into it. Um, we know that some bees prefer flat and on the whole it seems that bees prefer flat or gently sloping but some will go for completely vertical faces um, so the, the, there's no simple straightforward general advice um, just try and make sure you have bare soil in in the sun is probably better but if it's in the shade that'll be okay 
Okay, perfect. So this woman said that she keeps mulch one to three feet away from tree trunks. Will that bear ground around trees and encourage bee nesting? Sure. If, if, if the bees are there and they find it, then yeah, that, they'll occupy the bare soil they've got. Okay, perfect. So if you, I think a lot of people have these questions specifically to um, the bee houses. If you do put out stems or put out bee houses, how long do you leave them there? Um, if, if your bee house, if you have straws or it's one of, a binder board is a term I used but didn't really explain, but basically it's a series of planks that are a groove so that when the planks close together, um, the grooves match up and create the, the nesting tunnels through, but you can then just open them up and, and access. So if you have a binder board like that, or you have paper straws, then your, your cleaning is going to be an annual thing. So um, by the fall, you'll be able to take the, take the blocks down, pull the straws, open the boards, and then, then clean out. Um, you know, you, you'll take any... Uh, nesting cocoons um, and, and nest straws and you'll put those into storage um, a, a cool ventilated place some people just put them into their fridge um, other people will find a, a, a undisturbed corner in their garage if it's cool enough um, but uh, otherwise you then then you'll, you'll um, once you've taken the nest out then you'll be able to clean out the the tunnels use a mild bleach solution to scrub them clean and, and soak them out um, and then you can put those blocks back out come late winter early spring and you can take your um, nest out and put those into a into a container with a large hole so that it's big enough for all the emerging bees to find it and go out, but not so so small that it looks like it might be a good nesting spot because you don't want really want bees to go back in to start nesting. And so, I mean, I mean that's the basic annual cycle if you are cleaning your, your nest blocks. But if you're not cleaning them, then you're looking at two, three, maybe four year cycle um, where you can, you can um, leave the blocks up for a, for that long because after a couple of years the holes will hopefully be occupied um, and once they've been occupied generally nothing else will occupy them um, and so after that then take the blocks down and you can either take those blocks and just throw them away and put completely fresh new blocks up or you can take your old blocks and take your, your drill bits and just re-drill the hole and that pulls out and cleans um, all the, the nesting materials that are in there which it's a slightly dusty mucky business but you know wear, wear your dust mask and your uh, and your goggles and you'll be okay um, and then if, if you do decide to clean it once you've got the debris out and then take that mild bleach solution and, and sanitize the blocks and then put them out again the next spring. So the fall and spring timeline would be applicable to any state, really. We have people who are asking specific locations, like Pennsylvania. Specific, specific months. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't have a list of specific months. Um, I mean, you'll, you'll know when your garden goes dormant for the, for the winter. Um, it's, what, it's when you stop seeing any activity around your, your nest block. Um, there are a few bees that will emerge in, in late winter, but typically if you've still got snow on the ground, you won't have much bee activity. Perfect, thank you. So another question about bee houses. This, um, Karen said that she has a bee house and the birds are dining from it, especially the chickadees. <laughs> She's just asking, is she luring bees to the bee houses and making them more vulnerable to being eaten? instead of them finding a safer place? Um, I don't know if you're making them more vulnerable. I mean, if they find, find a natural place, they, it will be another tunnel, another hole that they're occupying. And um, just, a, you know, just as likely that a chickadee or a, or a woodpecker or even a squirrel, squirrels sometimes have been known to hook, hook the larvae out of nests. Um, but you can um, put up a, a protective screen around your bee nest using um, chicken wire or, or um, so I, I, I get confused by some names. Is it hardware cloth? Is that another word for that kind of wire mesh with the three quarter inch holes in it? Um, I, I, 
even though I've been living in the States for 20 years, I, I realize that sometimes I, I, I stumble over, over the correct words. Um, but just get a wire, me wire mesh. Um, it's what, what I always call chicken wire, which you can you know, make, a, make a cage area with, with the kind of hexagonal holes in it. Something that's about three quarter inch gap in the holes and then put put that around the front of the the nest block so it's a few inches away from the nest block um, the trouble with that is it's great for larger birds but three quarter inch it's always possible the chickadee might sneak through um, but it's likely that that mesh will be adequate to deter things perfect i think this is the same karen she must have a lot of great habitat in her yard She's <laughs> About the nests of grass carrying wasps that are in the corners and edges of her storm windows. Uh huh. Reloc relocate them because obviously they need to close the storm windows once the weather gets cold and she's worried that it's going to destroy the nests. Um, yeah, it, it may. And that's one of the unfortunate things when you have a situation like that where you've, you've got an unintentional spot which could be occupied. Um, the the nests of grass carrier wasps will be a, a series of cells going down the tunnel with um, cut pieces of grass between each of the cells, um, and so if you have those down down a tunnel, um, it's just an awkward thing because without actually seeing the the precise um, situation, it's difficult to judge whether putting the storm winders in and out will disturb the nests. Um, but it may just be that the, the because you, I don't think that it's possible to move those nests because you can't pick the cells up. It's not like a, a leaf cutter um, cell that's a complete, um, completely contained unit or a, a, um, a mason bee cocoon, which again is this self-contained little object that you can move. Um, because if you've got a, most bees there, their brood cells, once the bees are pupating in the brood cell, it is just a pupa in the cell and unprotected. Um, and so and, unless you have a way to pick up the entire nest and move it, um, which involves picking up the structure or having it in a straw, um, there may not be a way to, to actually move that, that nest. Um, but uh, yeah. I'm, I realize I'm rambling a bit because I'm, I'm processing it in my head, trying to figure out what I imagine and picture what, what's happening there. Um, but it, it may just be, it could well be one of the unfortunate situations where the, the, those nests can, can't be saved. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. So we're going to move on to another issue. A few people are asking, or not issue, a challenge. A few people are asking about is the leaf litter and leaving it down without encouraging mosquitoes. This, this um, person in particular, a lot of Karen's on the call today. Um, she's been leaving it out, but she also watched a webinar in a local extension service and suggested that they should shred it and remove it so water doesn't collect in the dead leaves and bring mosquitoes. Mm -hmm. And a few other people in that same line are asking about maybe breaking down large like magnolia, uh, magnolia leaves halfway down, if that would be okay. And then other <laughs> asking about shredding leaves in the spring because oak leaves leave sort of an impermeable layer on grass and beds. I think if you decide to break down a few of the larger leaves um, in the fall, that makes sense. I think what you're looking for is just a couple inches of insulation. And so the size of the leaf likely doesn't matter so much as, as long as you've got lots of layers. So if you're looking to, I hadn't heard that about mosquitoes, but I can see how in some regions that might be an issue. So um, I think just uh, breaking them down a little bit could be really helpful in avoiding having that collection of water from mosquitoes. So um, yeah, and if it's a concern about having it on your lawn, if, feel free to adapt that advice to what makes the most sense for your situation. So feel free to rake them off of your lawn and put them in places where it's not going to cause you some issues. Yeah, no, I, I would just echo what um, Jennifer said there regarding leaves on lawns. Um, the, the idea behind our, our Leave the Leaves campaign was not that you should um, you know, abandon them all and, and have a carpet that's, that smothers your grass. It was really to avoid people clearing them all away. 
Um, again, it's pushing people away from that idea of um, the landscape being too manicured and too um, maintained to, to, some, uh, to meet some seemingly artificial standard. Um, so yeah, by all means, clear, clear them off your lawn, um, then, then pile them up in the back corner somewhere, push them underneath the, the bottom of a hedgerow, find, find somewhere to keep some leaves, um, even if, I mean, it's, it's fine to not keep every leaf. That, that photograph that um, Jennifer had, that, that was my own front yard, and you'll see that my lawn was clear because I piled them up onto the, um, the, the flower borders where they can gradually mulch down, and provide cover there, and then help build the soil. Thank you. This next question is very interesting. Uh, this person's asking if a tree has been treated with systemic pesticides, but then it dies, should they leave the snag there or will those pesticides continue in the dead matter and impact insects that feed off of it? <clears throat> That's a really interesting question. Um, my sense is that because the systemic pesticides are in the, the living tissue of the tree, it gets into the sap, and that, that's the reason why systemic pesticides are, are a problem. Um, but also the reason why they're used, because if it's to stop a, you know, a, a sucking plant bug, for example, then you need it in the plant juices. But so once the, once the tree is dead, it doesn't have that sap movement, it doesn't have those juices moving around. So I don't think the systemic pesticide will be a, a direct problem um, because the, the insects are occupying holes in the wood and not chewing on the, on the tissue. Does that make sense, Jennifer? Mm -hmm. Great. So this question is specific to the pond. They asked about water evaporation in your pond. Is that a problem? And is it okay to fill with hose water even though there's chlorine in the city water? Yeah, um, we have had evaporation problems just mostly this month, and I guess I meant August actually, just because it's been hot and hasn't rained in a while. Um, we've been collecting, we emptied a rain barrel into it, and now we've been just collecting water from the dehumidifier. Um, yeah, it does have chlorine in it, so if you're going to put it, add it to the pond, you can put it in a bucket and let it sit for a day or two before putting it into the pond. That's the, that's preferable than just putting in from the hose. But I haven't had too much up until we had, it, it just hasn't rained for weeks. Yeah, it, uh, just the, the reason for leaving it in the bucket is the chlorine will evaporate. Yeah, thank you. That's yeah, cool. and of course, if, if you have buckets of water standing around for too long, you could have mosquito issues. So, <laughs> um, yeah, it, if, if, you, if you have buckets standing for a couple of days, you can get buckets with lids. So, you know, you might have a bucket full to put in each day. Um, and the only reason I jumped in is because I've, I've actually had a few ponds in my own yard and, and over the years have helped build a lot of ponds and school grounds and so on. So um, in fact, when that earlier question came in about, will it be a lot of work? And because my husband's a bit concerned, I, I know it's a stereotype, but guys seem to love things they can ride on and drive around in, you know, ride on lawn mowers. Um, gadgets that have any because you, you can hire mini excavators which are really you know you so if you want a bigger pond it takes it takes a lot of the work out of it and you can get an amazing amount dug um, with just a small excavator rather than spending a few days digging with a shovel perfect thank you um, are you guys okay going a few minutes over, maybe 10 minutes over to answer a few more questions? Yeah, I'm, I'm fine to hang around, yeah. Yeah, I think that's good. Okay, so we'll just go about 10 more minutes. So we have a few more, we have a lot more questions, but we'll try to get through um, a few. Someone asked specifically about brush piles and how do you prevent rodents, specifically rats, from nesting in them? Hmm. Um, I, I, I don't know if there is a, a, a particular way to exclude um, animals like that. Um, that is a, a potential problem. Um, 
with with brush piles and i know sometimes some people in some regions also um, are concerned about um, snakes moving in um, so it, it's not uh, um, brush piles are a, a good thing to have because they bring some some of that shelter and some of those um, the the features that are often missing from from gardens but you, they they do also provide shelter for all sorts of different wildlife um, I know in my experience, I've, I've not noticed any, any problems from um, brush piles that I've built, but uh, that may, may have just been lucky. I just want to say solidarity. I have a compost pile that rats really like. <laughs> and I've tried a lot of different things. <laughs> Someone just said that they said don't have any food available to them. So I think maybe compost pile being by any brush pile might, maybe that's part of the problem. Another question we have specifically is about soil. Uh, do ground nesting bees more, need more loose soil or is it okay to be fairly compact? As I um, mentioned in a, in a previous answer, on, on the whole, um, bees prefer sandier soil, um, so I mean that is typically a slightly looser soil. Um, and I know often um, there are areas where you know new build yards. My own garden is an example. You know, the house is 20 years old, and so 20 years ago the front yard was a construction zone, and they took up all the good topsoil and filled it back in with with cruddy stuff that they probably dug up from the foundation. So that's taken a lot, quite a long time um, to, to begin to build the soil so it's better for growing things in. Um, and there are ways in which you can create ground nesting sites, such as by you know, dig, digging a hole as if you were gonna put a small pond in and then fill it with sand or fill it with a sandy loamy mixture. Um, and so you, you can take, there are, it is possible to take direct steps to, to um, create uh, the kind of soil conditions that bees really like. Um, the problem with that is that there's no guarantee that a bee will move in. And so on the whole, we, we, we re just recommend that people work with the soil they have um, and make sure that there's, bees have access to the bare surface. Um, there are some bees that that will nest in compacted soil if that's what you have. And sometimes the way that they'll make it usable is by carrying water to the soil to make it more malleable. So um, yeah, keep an eye out for that. That's pretty cool. We have a few more questions about mason bees. It's always a popular topic on here. A couple of people are asking if they leave their bee straws out in the winter and not put them in their garage or their fridge, is that okay? And then someone else um, said that they have a bee house that's been up for years and they've never cleaned it and every year they see lots of mason bee activity and should they clean it? Um, sure, I mean, in terms of taking your, taking your straws out, there's no, there's no obligation to take the straws out. Um, the, the bees need that, that cooler dormant period and their emergence is triggered by warming temperatures. Um, so as long as they, they have a cool period and then are exposed to the warmer conditions and that, that's fine. The, the, the guidance around um, removing the straws, cleaning the nests, et cetera, et cetera, um, developed from, from the process of using mason bees as a, as a managed pollinator of orchard crops whether that's commercial or just backyard. So, um, but if you prefer to leave your straws out and just leave your, your, your nest out through the winter and allow the natural processes, that's great. Um, and I was, I, I've just, the, the second question just slipped from my mind, Rachel, could you repeat it? Oh goodness. <laughs> oh, <laughs> sorry. Oh, already. No, it's totally I, fine. Uh, um, I believe the person has had a bee house up for a few years and they've never Oh, yes, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Activity, Sorry. so. Yeah. Oh, you're no, fine. <laughs> yeah, no, uh, you're, thank you for, for remembering better than I was. Um, yeah, I mean, th there's always the chance that the nest will, will, will keep being active. And if it is still 
being used, that, that's great. Um, the, what typically happens over a period of, of time is that the, the number of pest, um, sorry, of parasites that are occupying it um, or the amount of disease or fungi that grow in, in it um, just simply increases and gets, gets greater and greater. And so that the nest becomes less productive from the perspective of being um, something that the bees will, will be using. Um, but if it's still, if it's still productive, then, then, then leave it out. Okay, perfect. So this person has a few questions um, regarding cleaning out. They asked, what about holes that are filled, still filled in the following year? They have bricks with about 180 multi-sized holes from Germany, but there's <laughs> from last year that didn't open. And they've read that these have two year cycles before they emerge. They do have potter wasps in their bricks that opened finished sealed tunnels, carried in larvae, and finally sealed the tunnels again. Did they kill the larvae or eat the eggs? And that's what was in there before. And then um, they have another question, but I'll wait <laughs> because it's not related. Yeah, no, that, that's, that's really interesting. Um, yeah, that, that's one of the things that's been happening recently. And it, it's really fascinating and encouraging from my perspective to see the number of ideas people are coming up with for creating nesting structures. Um, and some of these, I mean, I know from my experience of seeing what's been happening in Britain and, and Germany was just mentioned there. So there's several countries in Europe where people are looking for ways in which they can create insect habitat that can be incorporated into buildings. And so there are these blocks that are sized to be the same size as uh, building construction bricks so that you can just build it into a wall. Um, but the downside is that you get this, this problem of maintenance and upkeep and cleaning. Um, and particularly where you have a lot of holes, you, you can have a greater buildup of, of diseases and parasites. Um, the, it, it's very simple because the, when you have, a, a, just to backtrack, sorry, any, any nest has the larvae in it or it has the nectar pollen supply in it, which is a wonderful food source. That, and a resource that is likely to be of, uh, of interest to another animal. Um, and so the, when you have a larger concentration of that, it's going to become a greater attraction. Um, for cleaning it out, yeah, timing of cleaning out existing holes is always difficult because unless you're monitoring very closely and keeping track of which holes were occupied when, and which holes have been um, opened up, you're never going to know for sure whether, whether the tunnel is um, dormant um, or you, know, you, get, you might have a, a nest that's put in and, and, and you know, everything got parasitized or died because of the, the fungus or disease. Um, so there's, there's always that risk. Um, if you've got 100 50, 180 holes, the chances are that most of those are not occupied. And so there, there will be a risk of, of causing some disturbance. Um, but you, you may just have, um, have to accept those, those losses if you try to clean out the entire block. Um, the potter wasp, wow, what's going on with, with potter wasps? Are because potter, potter wasps usually make um, a, a, an individual cell that looks a little bit like a ceramic, a terracotta pot. Um, and it's usually on the outside of something rather than down a tunnel. So if there is a wasp that seem, seems to have opened up a nest tunnel and is removing or is seen carrying larvae in and out, it may well be raiding that, that tunnel nest and taking, taking the food off to feed its own, uh, own larvae and stock its own nest. So their last question that they had, um, apologies, let me find it here, it disappeared. So it's about splintering when they cut pithy stems that sometimes they do splinter and they're wondering if there's anything to um, present or prevent any of that splintering or if it is an issue for bees. Um, you know what, I, I think that it can happen a lot in nature too. The way that bees get access to stems in nature is when deer, for example, browse the stem um, 
and then that gives them a way to access the stem. Otherwise, if the stem is intact, bees can't get into it to nest because they oftentimes can't chew through that woody material. So splintering isn't necessarily a threat to bees because um, they do need some way to access the stem. If you've got a splinter that goes all the way down the stem, then it's probably not going to be usable. The stem won't be usable by um, much of anything, except maybe spiders would take find that still usable. But um, but if you've got just a little splinter at the top, that's that's not necessarily something I would worry about too much. Okay, perfect. Well, we have time for one more question. Um, this person's asking if you do decide to build a pond, should it be in sun, shade, or partial, which is best? I think you do want some sun, so sun or partial. Yeah. Uh, um, you, ideally, you probably want six to eight hours of sunshine for a pond. Um, but some, some, some yards, you, that's not possible. So just, just pick the sunniest patch you've got. Right. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't have a full sun space. So work with what you have. It'll, it'll be good. Oh, yeah. Well, that's all the time we have for questions today. I just want to say thank you so much, Jennifer and Matthew, for joining us and for all the great information and the inspiration, I think, as well. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, everybody.